Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our latest Modern Slavery Act webinar titled Four Years On. We've got three fabulous speakers that I'll introduce to you in a moment. Uh, first of all, I'd rather like to uh, do the acknowledgement of country, which will be done by uh, my te or our 10 year old daughter, Florence. Today, I would like to pay my respects to the elders, past, present, and future, for they hold the memories, traditions, culture, and hopes for Indigenous Australia. Today, we stand on the Yuga Bear land. Thanks, Florence. Um, and so we've got three great speakers, as I mentioned. We've got Margaret Stewart from Nestle. We've also got Professor Justine Nolan and Amy Sinclair. And I'll introduce them all individually as we go through the program. If I could just ask you to hold off all your questions and put them into the chat box, that would be brilliant. We'll come to the questions at the end of what I'm, I'm certain will be two very good sessions. So without further ado, let me just introduce you to Margaret Stewart. Margaret, Margaret is the Director of Corporate Affairs and Sustainability for Nestle Oceania, covering Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific. Margaret works across a portfolio of iconic food and beverage brands focusing on a regenerative food system and Nestle's zero emissions target. Over to you, Margaret. Thanks, Nicholas. Today, I want to talk a bit about Nestle's approach to human rights due diligence. Um, this is a really important topic for Nestle where we've been putting a lot of focus. But you came here to hear me talk about modern slavery and my heading has just said human rights due diligence. So let me explain why I want to do it this way. It's because modern slavery is not just about modern slavery. It's a part of a package of things we need to think about when we think about human rights. And if there's one thing that's for sure, it's that um, due diligence needs to be right at the heart of what we do. I think in Australia with the Modern Slavery Act, there's been a tendency to be a little too focused on, I have to do report, it's got to be compliant, it's got to be signed off. But if we do that, we actually miss the point. I'm so sure we have to do those things, but the point is how do we think more broadly about human rights? What does due diligence look like and how do we make a difference for people? So Nestle's had a history of embedding human rights into our business activities for quite a long time. It goes back to 2008 when we first worked with the Danish Institute of Human Rights and we have continued over the years to build on that and grow that, extending the work, extending transparency, in, um, extending reporting year by year. The really important thing to get out of that is that you're not going to do it all overnight because you will learn as you go, things have to change, things have to adjust. And so for us, while the Modern Slavery Act in Australia is four years old, and we at this point have reported twice and are now working on our third report, um, the history goes much goes back further than that and the development will continue into the future. So our progress so far, we have human rights incorporated into policies, we've trained people, we've done human rights impact assessments in high-risk countries. I'll add there that every time we do a human rights impact assessment, we actually involve um, expert groups such as the Danish Institute for Human Rights to support us on that. Um, Having um, expert advice to help you is really, really critical. Our specialty is making food and beverages, not unnecessarily understanding human rights impacts. And so we need to make sure we have great advice. Obviously, human rights is in our enterprise risk management system. It's right through our governance structure and we report on it transparently. So our next steps, well, where do we go? from here. So we've got systems and processes, where do we go from there? So how do we strengthen our due diligence? How do we move forward and where are we heading? So what we did, did is we took our initial human rights framework, which, which sorry, we built a new human rights framework and roadmap that has due diligence right at its heart. And due diligence has to sit in the centre because that helps us understand where our risks are, where the risks to people are, and where we make an impact from there. And so around that, we have salient issue action plans. I'll get onto those. And we look at the enablers that we have around 
um, governance and incentives, policies, control systems, engagement and advocacy, partnerships and transparency and reporting. I'm going to pause here for half a second and say I have a lot of words on these slides. Um, there will be links provided that will take you to our website that will show you that human rights framework in detail and explain those enablers in more detail. Um, and everything that's here is actually available on our website. Um, so from that, we then identified 10 human rights issues that we saw as salient, and you can see them all there. Now, the important thing to know about human rights is that none of them sit independently of each other. They, there are interdependencies through them all. So if we think about modern slavery in isolation, then we run the risk of potentially um, losing the fact that slavery has gender equity issues in there, that there's occupational health and safety issues in there as well, that you need to think about freedom of association and collective bargaining. Um, child labour is part of it as well. So if we look at the question of slavery and forced labour in isolation, we can actually lose sight of what the triggers are that can lead to situations of modern slavery. And so what I've done there, that um, glamorous little pink box, sits around all the issues that we see in our salient issues as being tied into forced labour and responsible recruitment. So la um, last month we, hang on, I didn't press the right button, there we go. Last month um, we, um, so, sorry, I should have, so, Sorry, I've lost myself. Back to forced labour. Um, this is actually important for us because there's over 27 million people estimated to be trapped in forced labour. And um, agriculture is a key area of risk. And so we have done a detailed um, salient, um, um, we've done a detailed action plan for that that now sits on our website that goes through, through all of that in detail, explaining exactly where we head from here on that issue. Now, in each one of our um, salient issue action plans, we've got indicators in there that will help us measure our effectiveness and understand things effectively. Some of those sit across all 10 of the action plans, and these are the ones that sit across all of them. They will be included in our external reporting as well. Um, there are also, for each action plan, there are actually issue-specific um, indicators for each one as well. Um, another critical thing that we've done is um, we've de strengthened governance for um, how we implement effectively. So um, the governance now sits right with executive board level, goes through to our, um, and goes right through the business to various levels. Um, I sit down there in that market compliance committee area because I'm part of a market. Um, I'm and, but I also have close connection into um, the, the global head of social impact and human rights and into that human rights committee and core human rights activity, the core human rights team. That makes sure that um, everything is managed holistically right through the business. So where does this head for how we think about Australia's Modern Slavery Act? How is what Nestle is doing globally really relevant for that? Well, I have to go, the first thing you have to do is think about what is the purpose of the Act? The purpose of the Act is about people. It's about how do we make sure that our business is not having a negative impact on people and their rights. The Modern Slavery Act don't be fooled into thinking it's about reporting because its goal is not to produce reports. Its goal is to make sure um, that people are inappropriate work and um, to ensure that situations where slavery comes into play are identified and addressed. Another interesting question, what did the Act change for Nestle? I'm going to say that's kind of a challenging one. We were already reporting before the Modern Slavery Act was in place and actually we were reporting um, before the UK Act came in place. That was just part of our normal global reporting. And our reporting that we, our Modern Slavery Act report has been designed to report that information in a format that is compliant with the requirement of both those acts. It hasn't for us substantially changed what we do um, because what we do has been changed by how we've engaged with stakeholders, how we've engaged with expert advisors, how our thinking on human rights and on due diligence and um, on um, how you might act on human rights risks has developed and progressed over time. So we do report across the Act, but the Act for us has not 
really um, had a significant impact on shaping our action because our action was already there and is of course continuing. Um, engagement with our um, customers has been um, interesting. Most people don't know that we have um, part of our business um, is a business to business model. Most of you will know us by our supermarket products, but um, we have a lot of businesses that we supply as well. And I think one of the um, revealing things for that has been the extent to which business needs and still needs support to understand what they need to do. Um, so sometimes um, some of the questionnaires um, and requests for information that come to us um, unfortunately don't really reflect an understanding yet of what they're trying to achieve. Um, and um, sometimes they can be a little compliance focused, whereas we need to keep thinking about, about people, where are the risks for people and how do we address those risks. Um, so I, I, I'll say it again, human rights, it's not just about modern slavery. It's not just a report. You need to think about human rights more broadly to think about those inter, the intersections between different human rights and the impact that they can have on people. Um, if, as, as I said, if you think about modern slavery in isolation, you will miss all the other things. And that for us has been um, a lesson as we've gone through um, and if I look particularly at the work that we've done in COCO, um, over time um, that started out very farmer focused and then it grew over time to include a child labour monitor monitoring and remediation scheme. Um, it grew to include a gender element as well. Um, it grew to include living wage. Um, and so those questions have, as the layers build, the work that we have done has expanded out to cover that. And it now covers um, addressing um, a far broader range of things than simply slavery alone, um, because that is what needs to be done to do the work. And if you focus just on um, modern slavery, that is an extreme um, that starts with um, are your wages paid correctly in Australia um, and moves all the way through to the more extreme situation. So you need to look at it holistically, not wait until something falls in the bucket of modern slavery. Um, I can't emphasise enough, get external expertise. Um, there are people out there and organisations out there that are able to help you shape your thinking and understand what you need to do to make a difference to people. It's really easy if you think they're overseas to dehumanise people, but you need to understand that this actually really has a genuine impact. And also, of course, continue to learn and change as you go. Um, I'm not expecting to turn around tomorrow and see um, every business with um, salient um, impact action plans in place. That is something that came with time and with development and as we have continued to think. Also, I'll, I'll start with, I'll end with where I started. Human rights due diligence has to be at the heart of what you do. So from Nestle's perspective, we completely support um, legislation that would provide incentives for companies to address their impacts. Um, and create a level playing field. And we think that's an important way to go. If you are not looking at human rights due diligence based on um, the UN guiding principles, then that's that is really where you need to go back to those basics and understand that. Um, so I'm looking forward to your questions and um, I'm gonna head back to Nicholas. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, really interesting to see uh, and very encouraging, obviously, to see an organisation of the size of Nestle really being a driving force even before legislation came out. A couple of points that I picked up there, the interconnectedness of it all. Modern slavery is one aspect, but it's connected to gender, it's connected to all sorts of other things. And, and at Inform 365, we often use the the sort of analogy with the Trojan horse. If you're doing modern slavery, you might as well look at some other aspects, health and safety, gender, environmental, climate risk. All of these things are sort of interconnected in, in, a, in a very complex yet highly interconnected manner. And so it is good to look at these things all in connection with each other. Um, just a quick reminder, please start typing away your questions into the chat box. Uh, and I will now, I'm really delighted to introduce two speakers that are going to play off each other a little bit, Amy Sinclair and Professor Justine Nolan. 
Amy is well known in, in the circles around modern slavery and human rights. She's been a lawyer for over two decades now and is the Australia, New Zealand and Pacific representative for the international NGO, the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre. She has helped drive the business and human rights agenda in the region, including the introduction of the Modern Slavery Act, and she holds expert appointments in the Australian Government, Law Council of Australia, and Law Society of New South Wales. Professor Justine Nolan, a lot of you on this call will, will know her as well. She's the director of the Australian Human Rights Institute and a professor in the Faculty of Law and Justice at UNSW in Sydney. Uh, she wrote a book recently with Martin Bersma called Addressing Modern Slavery. If you haven't read it, please read it. This book examines how consumers, business and government are both part of the problem and the solution in curbing modern slavery. She advises companies, NGOs, governments uh, on these issues and was also a member of the Australian government's Modern Slavery Expert Advisory Group. That's enough from me. Over to you, Amy and Justine. Thank you so much, Nicholas, um, and thank you to everyone for your time today. Amy and I are going to talk about um, a project that we've been working on for over two years now in our most recent report, um, which is called Broken Promises. Um, and this report was a part of a research consortium. And you can see here that this um, consortium includes three NGOs um, and four, uh, five universities um, who have been involved in this. And the Broken Promises was our report that we issued in 2022. Um, and prior to that, um, we issued a report called Paper Promises. And the idea of these, this research report, which was funded by, in part by the Australian government's uh, National Action Plan to Combat Modern Slavery, is to take a longitudinal view of modern slavery reporting and try and figure out what companies are doing. Um, and then uh, following this, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, we've also tried to look at what they might say they're doing in their statements and then um, through interviews and focus groups, what they're actually doing on the ground. But our idea and part of this research is to test the effectiveness of reporting under the Australian Modern Slavery Act and see if it is going to be a useful tool um, for really not only raising awareness um, with companies in Australia who are addressing this issue, but actually a tool to change practices. Um, and what we're gonna to present to you today is our findings um, from this Broken Promises report. Thanks, Justine, and thanks, Nicholas. I'm Amy Sinclair from the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre, and I'm joining you today from the lands of the Camaragal people of North Sydney, to whom I pay my respects. Um, so, as Justine um, mentioned briefly, our main aim with the Broken Promises report was to build on our initial assessment of round one Modern Slavery Act statements um, which is reported on in Paper Promises. And for the for in round two, we were again assessing statements um, and we were looking to see, uh, you know, how companies' performance has changed over time between the first and the second round of Modern Slavery Act um, reporting and, and use the statements as a way to evaluate the effectiveness of the, of the Act. Our key guiding questions in the research um, that we were doing both in Paper Promises and then the follow-up report, Broken Promises, um, were, were really three key questions. Firstly, are companies complying with the Modern Slavery Act and its Section 16 mandatory reporting criteria? Uh, secondly, are companies disclosing the key modern slavery risks that are present in their sectors? Uh, thirdly, is there evidence of meaningful action by companies to address these risks in their statements? Um, and additionally, in, in Broken Promises, we were looking um, at the question whether or not the promises um, that companies had made in their first round of reports had been met in the second year of reporting under the Modern Slavery Act. So in snapshot, our key findings um, were that Two thirds of the companies that we assessed are still failing to comply with basic reporting requirements of the Modern Slavery Act, uh, and some companies are failing to report at all. Half of the companies that we looked at are failing to identify obvious modern 
slavery risks that are known to exist in the sectors in which they're operating. And two thirds of those that we assessed are failing to take effective action to address those risks. Um, generally, companies are still not disclosing what they're finding in terms of modern slavery. Uh, in, in paper promises, we found that only 8% of companies are disclosing actual cases of modern slavery that they have had to grapple with. Um, and that figure had gone up to 14% um, in broken promises. And in broken promises, we also found that over half of the promises or forward looking statements or commitments to continuous um, improvement that were stated in round one modern slavery reports remained unfulfilled in round two. So we concluded from these findings um, overall that reporting in and of itself is unlikely to result in transformative changes um, in company behavior, those types of trans transformative changes that, will, that are needed to eliminate um, modern slavery. So what was our methodology um, in this research? We've examined, as I said, the round one and the round two Modern Slavery Act statements for the same cohort of approximately 100 companies. Uh, this number was slightly less in our second report, uh, looking at round two statements, because some of those original statements uh, were missing from the government register. Uh, we were looking at the same group of companies for both reports, and those companies are listed in the two reports. So these are these are companies that are sourcing goods um, with well-known modern slavery risks that are operating in four high-risk sectors. Uh, so we looked at companies importing um, garments from China into Australia. Uh, we also looked at disposable rubber gloves, uh, which were so incredibly important during COVID as PPE. Uh, we looked at um, fresh horticultural produce sourced from Australia. And the fourth category was seafood from Thailand. We had a trained team of assessors who reviewed the statements against a set of 63 indicators. Uh, these indicators have been designed by us to measure compliance with the reporting requirements of the Act, but also more broadly to measure the depth of um, companies' responses to addressing modern slavery. For broken promises, we also assess the extent to which the uh, forward-looking promises made in round one appeared to have been met on the basis of information that was provi provided in um, the statements of those companies in round two. Um, and we also looked at the extent to which statements appeared to have been recycled. So statements were treated by us as recycled, where there were minimal or really no changes that had been made to the text of the statement um, from round one, and where any changes that had been made were so insignificant as to have had no, um, no effect on scoring. And we found that 8% of the statements we reviewed in round one um, were recycled in round two, uh, which indicates a uh, lack of engagement um, with the law by um, by these by these companies. Um, it's also worth noting that we did find it difficult to locate um, all of the statements, and seven of the original statements uh, we were unable to find. Uh, this could be because of a number of uh, different reasons, including non-publication um, by the company. And this process really sort of revealed to us quite how challenging it is uh, in the absence of having a, a list of reporting entities to track compliance with the Act. And I'll hand over to Justine here. Thanks, Amy. So one of the things that we were looking at, we're trying to get to this point around um, how is the Act changing behaviour? Um, Margaret at the start talked about that the Modern Slavery Act isn't just about reporting. Um, that what it's trying to do is to drive a change in behaviour to better address modern slavery. So reporting is sort of the last stage of that. After companies are taking, you know, really what we call effect, effective action, then then reporting is basically just tracking that, holding them accountable publicly. So the focus has to be on action more than reporting. 
But what we found in our statements is that this wasn't always the case and there is very much a preponderance of um, attention on the reporting. So how do we define what we call um, effective action? As Amy mentioned, we said that um, we concluded that just one in um, three companies, around 33% of companies, really did demonstrate a form of effective action. So this was looking at a range of factors. So Margaret's right in that when a company is assessing these issues, they shouldn't be myopic at just trying to figure out what modern slavery is. Modern slavery sits on a continuum of exploitation and you have to have a whole, holistic view that you know, wage theft or wage underpayment by itself may not constitute modern slavery, but that coupled with other factors of coercion and other things may lead to severe exploitation in the workplace. So we looked at a number of issues around what companies are doing to assess whether we thought they were taking effective action. So for example, one of them was this idea of human rights due diligence, which Margaret spoke about, which in a very sort of simple terms is about companies undertaking in an ongoing and consistent manner um, mechanisms by which they engage with stakeholders, they identify problems, they publicly report on them, and they figure out how to remediate them and address them. So it's this ongoing cycle of attention focused on um, human rights issues um, where a company is diligently uh, applying that. Based on what we could see in the statements, only 26% of, of companies reported that they are undertaking that process. We are seeing now in Europe a lot of emerging legislation where this is becoming mandatory. And there are many Australian companies, supply chains, which will be caught up in that. And so it's something that is not sort of coming in the future and a long way away for Australian companies. It's very much here now and companies need to think about and what understand what human rights due diligence means. Um, 20% of companies um, showed some evidence of responsible purchasing practices. So this would actually show that they're understanding, um, identifying issues, and then thinking about how you integrate those risks and concerns into their business operations and address them um, within their, the way they engage with suppliers. 21% of companies um, expressed a commitment to paying a living wage. Um, wage rates are sort of the, the crux of many issues within supply chains. Um, the lack of ability of workers to earn a living wage means that they're often forced to work very long hours, um, forced overtime may flow from that. And it can be very much an indicator um, when a wage rate is so low and artificially low that it may lead to other forms of exploitation. Um, another example was that only 14% of companies expressly showed support for freedom of association. So the right of workers to unionise. Um, is something that companies should acknowledge and be welcomed um, in their supply chain. Another issue you often see, particularly in supply chains, is around the payment of recruitment fees, um, often high um, and illegal recruitment fees uh, in some supply chains. And 18, only 18% 18 of companies actually described a process for preventing this happening, so that they were actively realising this is a risk and um, looking at that. 35% um, of companies indicated that they show some evidence of collaboration. Margaret talked about consulting with experts. So in order to address modern slavery, companies have to collaborate. You have to go beyond sort of a comfortable risk level. You should have people in the room that actively do make you uncomfortable and think you think about ideas that you may not have thought about just with your peers. So this may involve consulting with trade unions, with civil societies, with other forms of worker representatives, with ac academics, with experts. But the idea is for a company to go outside their comfort zone and talk about these issues um, to get input. And so they were some of the issues that we were looking about at how a company, what that we would say is effectively addressing it if they're showing signs um, of that. Um, so Amy will talk about the improvement that we have between the statements between round one and round two. So did we find that the Modern Slavery Act is driving a race to the top in corporate responses to addressing modern slavery? Well, the, the aim of the Act is to create a transparency framework that will encourage just this to happen. Um, the Act does have a significant value as a transparency measure. Um, it's worth noting and recognising that it's done a great deal to raise awareness about modern slavery issues, uh, particularly at board level. Um, it's also codified expectations of business on modern slavery and responding to human rights issues. It's yielded useful information, which allows for improvements um, and changes in behaviour to be measured over time. And it's also created an important avenue of engagement with companies on human rights. However, our research findings indicate that reporting by itself really isn't bringing about 
sufficient enough changes um, that, that we need to see. And we found that on average over the two years that we were assessing, the rate of improvement in the quality of reporting was only 7%. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, companies are still not disclosing actual cases of modern slavery that they've been involved with. Uh, only 14% provided this information in round two, which was up from the 8% um, in round one. But really the quality and the extent of disclosures from companies on this question still remains really limited. Um, where there has been change found between rounds one and two of reporting, it's generally not happening in those areas that are more from fundamental to bringing about change and addressing modern slavery. Um, so as Justine mentioned, we're, we're not seeing, for example, evidence in statements of widespread business support for things like freedom of association, um, implementation of responsible purchasing practices and shifts in business models, uh, a really effective and, and meaningful engagement with workers um, and or, or the satisfactory resolution of grievances by companies. So even on a, on a basic measure of compliance with the Section 16 reporting requirements, we're really seeing that companies are failing to achieve adequate results. 77% uh, of the companies assessed by us failed to address all of the mandatory reporting requirements in round one, and this figure was 66% in round two. So even if we're seeing improvements in the actual techniques of reporting over time and perhaps fuller disclosures in statements, um, we've seen in our research that this doesn't necessarily equate with substantive compliance by companies um, and the, it doesn't equate with the introduction of effective steps by companies to address modern slavery. So the, the types of incremental improvements that can be achieved through a transparency approach nudged along over time are unlikely in the absence of other measures uh, to really adequately address modern slavery in business operations and supply chains. So why did we call this report Broken Promises? Well, very simply because half of those forward-looking promises or commitments to continuous uh, improvement that we recorded in round one statements remains un unmet in our um, assessment of statements in round two. Um, in round two, we were also looking to find evidence of improvements in compliance with the mandatory reporting criteria of section 16 of the Act. Um, and the good news here is that we are seeing more companies complying with these reporting criteria. Uh, two thirds of the companies that we looked at failed to meet all of these criteria in round two, um, which was an improvement on the three quarters of companies in round one that um, failed to meet all of these criteria. Although it should be noted that really we would want to see 100% compliance here. Um, given that these reporting criteria are mandatory. So um, these improvements are coming from a low bar. Um, and it represents a high level of non-compliance with the Act. Uh, it's interesting to note here that the area where we saw the biggest improvement in terms of Section 16 compliance uh, was in the reporting against Section 16.1F of the Act, which is describing the process of consultation and here we found that there was a 17% increase in compliance between round one and round two reporting. Um, uh, we think this may, uh, this is very likely associated with the fact that the government published our specialist advice on this point, uh, which is available on, on its register and really goes to show sort of how helpful this type of advice from the government can be in assisting uh, companies in complying with their requirements. The weakest area of reporting uh, remains describing how the effectiveness of actions um, is assessed by companies. This had a 61% compliance rate in round two and a 53% compliance rate in round one. So the Act um, would very much benefit from further clarity on this provision. 
So um, one of the other interesting things that we were looking at was around the risk awareness of companies so that, you know, we're now four years in, as Nicholas mentioned, to the sort of the modern slavery actions was introduced in 2018. Um, and we were analysing two years of reporting. So there's a lot more discussion around these risks in Australia. There's a lot more awareness of it. Um, so what we were looking at around, um, you know, how many companies are showing obvious awareness of the, the modern slavery risks. And we found that 43% of companies failed to identify what we would declare as sort of obvious supply chain risks. So we were focused specifically on sectors of which we knew there was a known risk of modern slavery. These sectors around garments, gloves, horticulture and seafood from specific geographical regions with known and well reported in the media um, supply chain risks. Uh, yet there was a significant number of companies in these sectors that failed to disclose, identify these types of risks in their report. So you can see that 72% of companies who are sourcing garments from China are still failing to identify the risk of Uyghur forced labour in their supply chains. So in the last four years, there have been a lot of attention on particular on goods coming out of Xinjiang. And one of those is around cotton supplies and the manufacture. And we have also seen that these risks are not just isolated to Xinjiang, but that there has also been what we call forced labour transfers from, from that region to other parts of China. So that where you are manufacturing in China, um, using cotton from these areas, um, you may also have not only that risk within the region, but all you also have may be subject to that workers in your factory that you're using were part of a forced labour transfer from Xinjiang. So this is a risk that companies who are sourcing garments from China should be well aware of. Um, in gloves, uh, we sort of noticed that 50% of companies from um, who are sourcing gloves from Malaysia failed to identify this sector as a risk. This is a sector that has been repeatedly identified, particularly in the US and with their legislation. Several companies have been under high profile investigation around modern slavery risks um, with this. Horticulture, we were looking at sourcing from Australia and 50% of companies sourcing from Australian products still fight, failed to identify this as a risk. Um, and often we, are, we did see a number of times in reports where companies would simply say, our supply chain and operations are wholly contained within Australia, so there is no risk. Um, and this might have been true around cleaning, security, um, horticulture. Horticulture has a high degree of migrant workers often coming from, um, often on transit, transitory visas, sometimes coming from the Pacific, international students. And we have seen, and the Fair Work Ombudsman has also detailed forced labour in this supply chain. And finally, seafood, another one that has been in the media quite a bit um, of the risk of coming out, particularly out of Southeast Asia. And 43% of companies sourcing seafood from Thailand um, failed to identify this as a risk. So this is something that indicates to us that companies are not actually doing due diligence into their supply chain where there are these really obvious risks and they're failing to mention them um, in their statement. So where do we get to um, in our reports? And um, we'll put a link into the chat around where you can identify, where you can find these reports. They're on the website at the Australian Human Rights Institute at UNSW. Um, in our paper promises report, in our broken promises report, um, we have some consistent recommendations. Uh, the first is that we, we think that the legislation needs to go beyond um, just reporting and it should require companies to undertake human rights due diligence uh, to address modern slavery. So the idea is that reporting is the culmination of this due diligence, which you're really doing to identify and address risks in your supply chain. We have to ensure that the Modern Slavery Act moves companies from sort of developing policies on paper to taking action. Um, and that's something that we're only seeing some a select group of companies do uh, at the moment. So we have to move beyond, beyond paper promises to actually to substantive action. Secondly, that we, we suggest that mandatory reporting has to be mandatory. So there's a high degree of non-compliance non at the moment, even meeting the Section 16 um, reporting criteria. And this would be better managed if there is some form of penalty, we suggest in the form of fines for non-reporting. Um, and that's one of the recommendations that many organisations have made to the current government review and which we should see results of that review coming up um, in hopefully April, May, shortly, that review will be released. Thirdly, um, we suggest that there needs to be the establishment of an independent anti-slavery commissioner by the government. And this should be not just a commissioner, but it should be a commission. So it has to be a well-resourced commission commissioner that has the ability to not only provide guidance around reporting and due diligence, 
um, but also undertake investigations and work with companies to improve practices um, in relation to this. And finally, we suggest that um, we need to take more seriously the ability and the need to remediate and address remediation around modern slavery, um, that we need to uh, think about how we embed a right of action, a cause of action for exploited workers so that they can take action to address modern slavery that they have experienced. So there are four key recommendations, which you can read about more um, in our reports. And in terms of next steps, since we released our Broken Promises report in November last year, um, the programme of research has continued. So we've run a number of uh, focus groups, industry focus groups, and we've also gathered data via a company survey to assess views on the Modern Slavery Act and you know, how it's being implemented internally within companies um, and the impact that it's having. So we'll be shortly uh, releasing another report with our findings from this latest research, uh, which reveals support for Modern Slavery Act reform, including um, the introduction of penalties. So there's more to come from us on this very soon. Um, thank you. And that's it from Justine and I, and I'll hand back over to Nicholas now. Thanks, Amy and Justine. Some very sobering numbers there, unfortunately, and a lot of the questions that have been coming in are sort of reflective of that. Uh, so I'll, I'll fire some questions straight at you. Why have company responses to the Monstay React not been stronger? Uh, over to you guys. Um, I'm happy to take that one, Nicholas. So uh, firstly, I think it's, you know, it's worth noting that you know, we are still in sort of relatively early days with the Modern Slavery Act. Um, and we should, we should anticipate that there will be improvements in reporting over time. In fact, we have detected improvements in, in reporting, albeit they are very slow. Um, and as I, as I noted um, earlier, unlikely to achieve the type of you know, transformative change and shifts in business models that we need to see to effectively address modern slavery. Um, I think you know there still needs to be more more awareness about modern slavery and the risks. Um, the results of our research showed that you know many companies are not identifying the risks that they really should um, know about and be very familiar with. Um, Another reason is that we, you know, we, we really need to see greater regulation of the Act and enforcement of the Act. Um, there are no penalties in the Act. And um, as we saw with the trajectory of the, of the UK Act and um, poor responses to that, uh, the absence of penalties um, really weakens the impact of the, of the legislation. Um, and also because addressing these easy the, these issues is really not not easy, which we've got a you know a, a glimpse into um, from Nestle, which is a company that has you know a, a, a very well progressed approach to addressing human rights. Um, it requires a shift in business models, and and, and also it costs money. Um, companies need to start. Um, you know, embedding decent labor costs into the price of doing business. Um, so there, there's a multitude of, um, of reasons behind why we haven't seen, um, you know, a stronger response to the act and others might want to comment on that also. I think the act has been very effective, um, Nicholas, in raising awareness and, and people starting to understand that this is a problem and it's a problem not only in you know overseas supply chains, it's a problem here in Australia, and it's also a problem in operations that you know companies need to be aware of their cleaning staff, security staff. Um, so this issue happens in Australia uh, as well. Um, and so the focus on awareness has been great, which has sort of forced companies to mobilize and think about what they're doing and respond in that manner. Um, but now we're four years in, it's the time for more seriously, how do you address this in a more systematic way? How do you actually think about how your business practices change um, in order that we're not always being reactive, but we're being proactive? Um, and that's the fundamental shift that we are seeing in a very select few of companies, but the majority are still much more of a knee-jerk reaction. We've got to report something, let's report what we're doing. What do we you know, say we were doing last year? Let's report something like that, rather than think about over that year, how do we take action? How do we engage with our suppliers? How do we work with unions? Um, so to think about, is our business model causing the problem? And that that's the type of action. That's the stage we're at now. 
No, really good response. But I might just fire a question at you, Margaret, on that one that's come in from the audience. Um, given sort of the, the resources that Nestle has admirably put into the human rights sort of movement, how successful do you think you've been so far? And where where would you like to take the, the, the journey that Nestle is on here? Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, I think any company that claimed magic success on this would be, um, I think, having a pretty serious lend of themselves because this is very much a long road. Um, often when you are looking, um, obviously the modern slavery act requires you to report on your supply chain and your operations. Your operations are a relatively simple thing to look at, and I use the word relatively, but that's relatively simple. But when you get in, into supply chains, it can be very difficult, particularly if you're talking about countries that are a long way away and um, workers in um, remote areas. Um, so there are, as I look across the various areas that we worked, there are areas where, where the sophistication of our tracking is greater or lesser, depending on where we're up to with that particular one. Um, I guess one that's particularly important for us is um, child labour in cocoa. Uh, we do keep quite tight metrics on that. Um, we have a child labour monitoring and remediation scheme where we employ people in each location to go and um, look for children who are at risk of being in child labour. And once they are identified, that's then, that's then passed on to somebody who is able to work and find what's the right situation for remediation for that child. Um, to date, um, we've been able to support just shy of, oh, sorry, to date meaning the end of last year, our last reporting period, um, we've been able to support just shy of 175,000 children through that and by giving them resources that will help them get, or them and their families, to give them resources that will get them from child labour, um, or in, inappropriate child labour, sorry, into a situation where they're receiving an education and so on. Um, the, com the causes of this are very complex and so it doesn't always stick. Um, it's the last figures I saw, which are probably a, a more than a year old now, we've just had our reporting come out the day before last and I don't have everything sitting in my head, is a, the, the outcome was sticking, for want of a better way of putting it, in about 50% of the children. Um, that has hopefully improved because as we look at those numbers and go, well, 50%, how do you make that better? We we change what we do to adapt to try and make sure that we get better outcomes um, in the longer term for those children. Um, bearing in mind that um, oh, and we've also introduced a new program in that time, um, early last year, designed to um, not just identify children being in child labour, but how do you prevent it at the first in the first instance. And so, for example, um, families involved in that scheme will receive a payment from Nestle when their children go to school, um, as opposed to just how do we fix the problem when they're not going to school. Um, and so it's making a difference. Um, we know with farmers it's making a difference to their productivity, um, but it can sometimes feel like two steps forward, one step back. Um, and you just need to keep going, but keep refining what you do to make sure that what you do um, gets better and is detailed. And sometimes part of that too is how do you look at your um, suppliers and how do you identify where suppliers are at. So if I look at the area of um, palm oil, for example, um, there are various um, human rights risks that sit in palm oil and labour. Um, again, that is something that is several tiers away from um, Nestle. We don't own palm oil plantations. We're buying from um, processors. Mm. Um, but instead, what, what one of the things we do there is we actually assess um, our suppliers in terms of their risks, um, looking at their labour supply chain, looking at their operational risks, looking at the maturity of human rights due diligence within their own businesses. And that, by supplier, um, helps us determine what our engagement will be with them. And that particular process that we take there and all the details of that is also um, on our website for anybody that wants to have a look. Um, and it spells out the actions that we take from there. So we're making a difference, but when you don't necessarily know what your baseline is, um, 
I can't necessarily answer the question, you know, is there some magic percentage I can give? No, this is work that is going to be ongoing and is going to be ongoing, I think, you know, forever. Um, as we continue to um, identify risks and address risks and um, see what can be done for people in those situations. Did that sort of answer the question? Yep, thanks, Margaret. I think it did. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll go back to uh, Justine and Amy on something. If you're reporting entity, there's a whole range of aspects that you need to look at uh, to be sort of compliant with the MSA legislation. Where do you see a difference between companies that are doing a purely cos cosmet cosmetic job versus someone that's actually doing something that has substance? C can you sort of try and distill that a little bit for the audience? Amy, you want to start? Yeah, thanks, Nicholas. Um, well, just, that was, we framed our research along those lines because that was a question that we were, you know, very keen to answer. So, as I said, we had a, we had a sort of three layer approach, firstly, to be looking at, you know, are, are companies disclosing the information that they are required to include in their statements in response to the subsections of section 16 of the act? Um, but, you know, broadly, is there evidence in companies modern slavery statements that they really understand the issues um, and are therefore in a position to be commencing the process of going about identifying problems um, and working through problems um, once once they're encountered um, so really you know there's reporting and there's the provision of information which you know sort of ticks the boxes of section 16 um, but underlying that are companies beginning to introduce those really sort of you know fundamental steps um, that are going to address the problem so you know are they supporting freedom of association of workers are they really engaging with stakeholders in the process of um, due diligence? Um, are they are they working with workers and workers' re representatives when problems um, come to light, uh, and are so in a position to sort of address you know grievances um, in an effective way? So, you know, whether or so really we were trying to identify whether companies are taking those, you know, underlying um, steps, have they you know, changed their sourcing um, patterns so that they're not issuing very rapid orders, which change at the last minute for very small quantities of products? Um, and are they building in uh, essentially, you know, decent um, decent wages and and a living wages for uh, living wage for workers in supply chains? Uh, Justine, you might want to add to that. Thanks. Um, I mean, I would just add very simply that um, I think everybody acknowledges that to do this well is not easy, but it's also not rocket science. Mm -hmm. So it's thinking about taking action and then sort of getting verification and working with others to ensure that that is correct. So if you, I mean, there's a reason why financial, you know, annual statements of public companies need to be audited because you want verification. You want to have another party look, have eyes on it. So that's the way that companies need to think about social risk as well, human rights risk, to think about what we identify as a company will be more well-rounded if we seek information externally, we involve others in how we address it and how we verify the problem. And that's what this is trying to do. That's a more substantive approach to compliance rather than a tick the box approach. No, I agree with that. Maybe a follow-on question. I'm not so sure that was covered in the research. Did you see certain industries that performed better and others that uh, have maybe gone backwards even? Uh, did you did you do any sort of analysis on on specific industries? Well, we were focused on these four sectors, um, and so that's what we were looking at, and um, we were then looking at from year one to year two. Um, I think that we're seeing in broader research uh, around, and, and, and I think, you know, when we're talking about the changes in approaches, there were only really slight improvements from year one to year two in those sectors which were high risk. So there's a number of other sectors, um, and I think some of the questions recognise that 
it's really hard to get into sort of lower tiers, that there's a lack of transparency, mm -hmm. that companies themselves are struggling to get that information. So it's one of those things where you're not expecting um, things to be perfect overnight. I mean, you know, Margaret referred to this as sort of really being a lifelong mission, but it's, you know, as a human rights lawyer, you're never going to be out of work. There's always something that you're dealing with. So it's looking at to say, you know, is a company trying to do more today than it did yesterday? What is it, you know, how to, what was our approach last year? Developing indicators for how you assess that rather than just sort of having a fluffy approach to would be nice if modern slavery sorts itself out and we'll come back and, you know, think about that later. Like anything in company, you know, in business, you have to think about what are the indicators that you will use to assess how you're making improvements, how you're stepping forward. Um, and so in each of the four sectors we looked at, there was really minimal um, improvement. And four years in now, I think that we're at a point where we need to be doing more than just raising awareness around risk. Can, can I weigh in here? I think a factor for companies is fear. Um, it's, um, you know, I present on a topic like this and it does feel a bit like, you know, everything's out there. And, um, you know, the last thing that I want to see is a headline that says something bad, you know, something bad about my business because then I have to deal with that. Um, and it's really important that there's actually, that companies can talk about this in a safe way mm. because when you're able to talk about it in a safe way, then you can do, then you feel safer to do more open assessments more um, um, and to talk more realistically about struggles. And I think, you know, some reporting looks like here's our policy and, we're, and, and isn't our policy great, but there is a fear of grappling with the next bit because you don't understand what you do if you find something and you're scared if you find something, somebody's going to call you out for it. Um, and I think something about that fear needs to be addressed for many companies, as well as um, you know, really not understanding the issues. And I and I think that's a great point, Margaret. And mm. I think there was a good um, that played out this year when we saw um, Woolworths disclose that they did find modern slavery um, in part of their supply chain, particularly around recruitment of workers. Um, they came out, acknowledged it publicly. They said that what you know what the problem was, what they were doing. Um, and that was actually very well received in the market yeah. and also with, within civil society. So the transparency level that we're seeing from companies like Nestle and Woolworths, um, Coles and others um, is actually being, I think, welcomed and placing them more as leaders rather. But, but at the moment, their leaders were still outliers. And so there, it is very important to understand that this is transparency is key and that we the more that we understand, then we will get improvement. Yeah. When, I, when Nestle did its first um, report on child labour in cocoa, um, the, which was late 2017, I saw the numbers in that report and how open it was about where um, what we hadn't achieved um, as well as what we had achieved. And I was actually, my first reaction was, oh, fasten your seatbelt. And um, because I really do expect us to be torn apart. And it was surprising when it, that didn't happen, um, which is, is, is hopeful that there is a way to have a more nuanced conversation about this. And it's also worth noting that, you know, fear of course and fear of reputational damage um, and, and loss of value to brand as a result is a really significant motivator in terms of taking, you know, taking, taking action. Um, and companies that, um, you know, have had a bad experience um, you know, don't want to have that experience repeated. And, you know, interestingly, um, whilst yeah, we were, as Justine said, looking at these four specific sectors where there's known high risk of modern slavery, um, in, in paper promises, it was evident that, for example, in the garment sector that we were looking at, um, there had been in a number of areas sort of further movement in that sector relative to the other sectors, you know, possibly because of the, you know, very, very sort of bright spotlight that was shone, up, shone on the garment sector as a result of the Rana Plaza um, tragedy and, and the fallout um, and the focus on supply chains as a result of that. So not to be, um, not to, not to overlook that, uh, that fear of reputational damage can be a significant motivator at times as well. All very good points, uh, and I totally agree that the narrative has to actually change if you do find things, uh, own up to them, and 
tell the public and the stakeholders how you're trying to address it, which leads me elegantly to a question that's come in. Uh, practically, how, how does a company tackle tier two, tier three and beyond challenges in countries such as China, where there might be a lack of transparency and accessibility. How, how, how do we practically, how does an organization go about that? What, what, what are your best sort of, what's your best advice there? Uh, over to all three of you, I'd, I'd imagine. So um, our approach has been, and I, I think of Thai fishing in particular because I was more directly involved in that one. Um, our approach there was to work with NGOs that could do the work. Mm. Um, first of all, they had expertise in dealing with um, exploited workers. And one of the challenges is um, actually that those that sometimes people don't want to tell you um, that they're in strife um, because they value the job that they have, um, even though that job is in many ways not good enough. Um, and so you, it's an area where you really need to rely on expertise going through. Mm -hmm. um, there is also... Um, you can call on your tier one suppliers and ask them to call on their suppliers and so on. Um, so traceability is, is really important. It is hard to do, but you need to just keep slogging on. But you do need to get that traceability in place. But then look for expert advice in country. So I guess Nestle, with its name and its reputation, its size, it might be easier. But if you're, say, a... It's going to make up a number here, $200 million turnover organisation with very, not as much pull. As easy. As well. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say it's easy. There is nothing here that is easy. No, no, um, but, but it's probably places, easier. For, there for are places less. where we should compete and yeah. there are places where we should not compete. And this is not a competitive space. Totally. Yeah. Um, this is a place where... Um, Often, and we find this even in our biggest commodities, we are not, in, as an individual company, big enough to change an entire supply chain, uh, sorry, an entire industry um, and the um, production systems of an entire commodity. Um, but working together with others, partnering with others will give you more muscle to do that as an industry. Um, it will also reduce your costs and of course it will improve your impact, which is really what this is about, is how you get impact for people. Um, so there are multiple areas. I think pretty much every, every commodity where we've done work here, there has been um, industry, cross industry involvement. In some instances, Nestle specific as well, um, across industry involvement, work with relative and um, relevant NGOs and others. Um, it's um, it's not a space that you that wise companies go into solo. It's a space where you need to bring expertise and and competitors. Um, if I go back to the early days of trying to deal with um, Thai fishing um, industry collaboration was really how we shared information and help and how we helped each other understand what was going on and where we went from there. Um, I can't underestimate the importance of working with others. I was a bit cheap saying easy. No, no, no. Appreciate that, Margaret. Two good points. Industry collaboration, number one, working with NGOs. Um, Amy and Justine, anything to add those as far as sort of delving into tier two and beyond? Um, well, I guess I would just say that, um, you know, it isn't easy, as Margaret says, and in some areas it's um, harder than others. But there are very few places where um, there's that sort of red line of where it's it's just most difficult. And Xinjiang is one of those at the moment because there is just not independent information coming out, out around um, factory conditions and working conditions um, in that region. Uh, North Korea is another. Um, some parts of Myanmar, um, but in a lot of other places, um, it's also working, you know, the, the availability of NGOs is more limited, um, but there is information about suppliers. And one of the questions I saw that came in was around, you know, if we're not getting correct information from our suppliers or they're not, uh, when, you know, how do, we, how do we deal with that? Do we call them out? Um, you know, and best practice is to try and obviously continue to work with suppliers where you can and create change rather than leave. But there are certain circumstances where it might be that a company needs to figure out what that red line is. So it might be a geopolitical issue or it might be a repeated efforts and there's still non-compliance around that. And the question then I think is also working with your peers to understand within a sector, 
around suppliers that are making an effort and rewarding those suppliers. So don't keep that information hidden. Talk to your, you know, talk among sectors around, you know, what suppliers are useful. And then those are the suppliers that would have longer term contracts, more stable contracts, uh, so that suppliers can see that others are being rewarded in the way that they work. I, I just add, I, I agree with everything that Margaret and Justine have just said on this. Um, uh, but sometimes you do reach that point where, you know, you're, you're at the red line and then, um, you know, and, and leverage isn't going to get you where you need to get to, then it's time to start thinking about, you know, if you are going to exit a situation, you know, how can you do that responsibly and, you know, with as little sort of harmful impacts on, on the workers in that situation um, as possible. But sometimes, you know, that's, that's just, that's the, that's, that's the end point. No, no, absolutely, totally agree. A couple of other questions sort of in the same vein. So you, you've got a supplier that basically is not interested in changing. Now, the obvious human reaction would be cut that supplier off. How far do you go to try and redress issues that you find within uh, your supply chain or specific suppliers? Um, I, can I talk to that one? Absolutely. Um, there are... The, these are complicated issues if they are if if they're direct, they, but they're not easy for suppliers to deal with either. And so, what you really want to look for with suppliers is: are they willing to act, and are they willing to change? Not necessarily have they solved the problem overnight, because um, they are frequently complex problems, complex multifactorial problems that cannot be solved overnight. Mm -hmm. And so what you really look for is a willingness to engage to change, um, to, for them to change their practices or do what needs to be done or allow you to engage with the workers or allow, allow whatever it is, but you're looking for that willingness to take action. If a company reaches, if a supplier reaches a point where they're not willing to take action and are continuing their practices that aren't okay, then it's time to say not no more. And I can see that somebody's also asked about going public on this. Um, we've had a number of suppliers in um, palm oil that have been unwilling to engage on various issues relating to environmental issues in particular. Um, and in those instances, we have made the decision to no longer purchase from that and that information too is publicly available um, so it's it's entirely because we're going to be held accountable for it um, regardless and so we need to say this is we, we couldn't engage here anymore and we moved away from that supplier but it's it, it is about sometimes your suppliers will not understand the issues themselves and so it really is about how do you work with the supplier and then you reach a point where you go, well, actually, there isn't room to work with them anymore. Um, but you have, but it's not fair to not work with them. Understood. Amy, Justine, anything to add to that? No, I think I answered in my previous response. Excellent. Just one other question around that. Um, and there's a bit of confusion around this. And I know a couple of examples of myself and maybe a question, two questions in this one. Um, Companies that are supposed to report and are not reporting and they're just flying under the radar, is there ever an opportunity that the government might issue a comprehensive list of who should be reporting? And what should one do if one knows of companies that should be reporting but aren't reporting? This has um, been something that's been, I think, a I remember being quite a vexed question in the development of the Act because there's not a simple way for companies, for the government to identify mm. companies that meet the criteria. That That's a problem. Um, and um, at the time, um, um, the view was held, let's give everybody a couple of years to get their act together and get this sorted out. Um, there would be, I think that couple of years has passed and it's time for reporting to be mandatory and for there to be penalties. There is no, without penalties, it's hard to know exactly where to go with where you would be reporting or what you would be doing. But it, I think in you know, the next review of the Act should include penalties for not reporting. Interesting to see, Margaret, that you're you're um, in favour of penalties, which I... Uh, oh, it's entirely appropriate. We're at yep. the point where it's entirely appropriate. If you don't report and you're supposed to report, then there should be a penalty. Perfect. No, totally agree with you. Justine, Amy, anything to add to that one? 
Yeah, so I'd, I'd add that certainly the issue of how important it is to have a, a list so that we can track compliance is is was very you know significant at the time that the Modern Slavery Act was being drafted and framed and and, and hasn't gone away. Um, one of the one of the um, areas that we've been advocating for change in is in is is in relation to how the government register itself actually works. Um, so you know this is this is a transparency regime. The idea is that you know as a result of the Modern Slavery Act, information is being produced by companies. It's available to consumers, investors. It's open to scrutiny by civil society groups such as ourselves, so that we can see you know, who is responding, how they're responding. Um, so, uh, you know, the government register itself, uh, really, we feel should be changed so that this basic information is really evident. Um, for example, you know, having some sort of traffic light system introduced. So, you know, when you search on a company name, it's apparent, you know, that they either, you know, have reported or they haven't reported. Um, you know, that they've hit the mandatory report, reporting criteria um, or not. So that, um, you know, it's it, it, it makes it far more, it's far more accessible to um, to form a view on, you know, whether this company is one that you want to be buying products from or whether it's a company, you know, as an investor that you that, that you want to be including in your portfolio. Um, so that would that's an area where we see that there's definitely room for um, improvement going forwards. Yeah, I, I agree. I just think that the law as designed at the moment isn't fit for purpose. Um, it's fit for purpose in raising awareness, but not then looking at enforcement. So essentially the, how the law is at the moment is basically saying, you know, we're asking companies about who have, uh, you know, 100 million and above to annual report, but we're not going to do follow up. Um, but it doesn't set in place um, either sanctions or incentives to encourage that behaviour. So if you think about companies reporting on their tax liabilities, essentially a similar law from the government might be that, you know, we're asking you to submit an annual tax return, but then we're going to ask civil society to monitor that to make sure you do and to make sure it's accurate, but the government doesn't really, you know, isn't going to follow up. So that doesn't make sense in that sector. So why does it make sense in the sector where people are working as slaves? So we have to think about when we develop laws and design them around encouraging enforcement and incentivizing behavior. Part of that might be sanctions, but part of it might also be thinking about, well, if companies don't report, they wouldn't be eligible for procurement contracts by the Commonwealth government, et cetera. So you're thinking about how you might encourage better compliance around issues like this and also around quality of reporting. Just on that one, Justine, I might just ask a follow up question on the New South Wales uh, Modern Slavery Act. Do you think that might actually be even more effective than the federal one? And is that going to be sort of almost the role model going forward? Um, well, the New South Wales Act has sort of undergone a design change. So originally, when it was first proposed, it also had a corporate reporting angle and it included um, fines uh, for non compliance with that. Um, but then um, where it ended up was basically it took that that section out so the companies in New South Wales are reporting under the Commonwealth Act and the New South Wales Act is more focused on um, the role of government and government agencies around reporting and action. So it has a different role. Um, it's used to complement the Commonwealth Act um, and businesses, you know, will be involved in it perhaps through government procurement, etc. cetera, um, but it's a complementary act rather than sort of trying to one-up the Commonwealth Act. Thanks, Justine. Now, maybe a question, and I know we've been going for over an hour now, uh, and we locked away an hour and a half. And if we, we if we finish a little bit earlier, no problem there, because I can see everyone's uh, thinking hard here, punching away questions as well. But I've got a question here that 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 might be quite relevant to a lot of the audience here, and that's uh, and probably to you, Justine and Amy, and and you as well, obviously, Margaret where what's coming down the pipeline as far as human rights is concerned what can we expect uh, nationally but also internationally what's going to start having an impact on the corporate landscape as far as human rights legislation is concerned so i think i mentioned when i was speaking around uh, emerging legislation um, that we're seeing particularly in europe um so there's a there's a movement um that movement from requiring of, of 
developing legislation that is focused on reporting and um, to requiring due diligence. So we've seen laws in France, um, in the Netherlands, in Norway and Germany, which are br more broadly focused laws that are focused on supply chain transparency and also um, about companies undertaking due diligence. And we're just starting to see some of those laws, particularly the French law, start to be tested in the courts about how companies are or are not taking that seriously. Within the broader EU, the, um, the EU issued um, a draft directive last year around um, what it is likely to be an EU directive, which will then flow out to all the EU countries, which is also focused on human rights and environmental due diligence. So this will be companies that are, will affect many Australian companies who are operating or supplying into Europe. Um, and all of them have different criteria and for eligibility about who falls within it. Locally, we've also seen um, within New Zealand, um, they're in the process of uh, developing their Modern Slavery Act, which also does include due diligence as a part of that. So it's not just focused on reporting. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, um, the government has just undertaken a three year review of Australia's Modern Slavery Act. And that um, report, which is being um, pulled together by Professor McMillan, um, will be provided to the government, we expect sometime in the next month or so, um, and then released after that. And that will be, that was, a, that was a high number of public submissions that were had input into that from companies, from NGOs, from academics and people around the world, looking at how do we improve this? Because I think everybody's on the same page, is that if we've got a law, let's make it work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Margaret was talking about there's no point in just Nestle doing something very well. I mean, obviously there's a point to that, but what Nestle wants to be is joined by its competitors, joined by other people in the sectors. So how do we incentivize that and how do we improve that? So I think this concept of due diligence, which we're seeing emerge in Europe, New Zealand, and I think, you know, at some point in Australia, we'll see that reflected in legislation. And the other thing that is coming down um, that we're seeing in some countries, say particularly like the US, are where they have got trade bans and import bans. So if, if, if goods are coming out of certain regions or countries uh, that are known to have forced labour uh, risks, then they're banned from being imported into the US. Australia has a draft law um, that would also be similar to the US one around a forced labour import bill. And I think that that will probably see likely come into legislation in the next few years. Uh, that's excellent. Thanks for that, Justine. And it's good to see that uh, from just from a legislation point of view that that pressure is building and hopefully that will have the impact that we're all wanting to see and the outcomes that we want to see. What what I'd love to do now is, is um, possibly close uh, if uh, all the panel speakers might want to just summarize sort of where they see this space going where they want it to go and how we can get there. Maybe each of you a couple of minutes on where you want to sort of see the whole space go and then we'll close after that. Could I start? Absolutely, Margaret. Go ahead. And while I'm at it, I'd like to cheat. I'd like to address a question that's popped up about um, us saying that we, me saying that we buy from palm oil processors and don't direct the own plantation sites looking like a way of avoiding engaging further. That's not it at all. Um, that is what a supply chain is. A supply chain is when you buy something from somebody, they've bought things from somebody else, they've bought things from somebody else and so on and so on. That is how companies supply chains work. We don't necessarily own raw material resources. But that is also what makes dealing with this so difficult. But also that's what makes it dealing with it so important. Anybody that just goes to their immediate supplier has got it wrong. Um, you need to go further back and understand what's behind the supplier and what's behind that supplier and what's behind that supplier. And in palm oil, that's what we've been doing for 10 years. Um, and you're more than welcome to look at info on our website for that. But on to the next question, where do I see things going? I think more, more interconnectedness between various human rights and less of a focus on um, forced labour as the sole human right we need to focus on. Um, Justine said it much better than I did, which when she referred to it as a continuum. We need to be thinking further up that continuum and not at the end. Um, mandatory due diligence um, in legislation. Um, this is something that is really needed to advance corporate awareness on human rights and environmental responsibility. And that should translate into collaborative, impactful, effective action. Um, I will add to that, there needs to be a growing awareness of the importance of human rights to a just transition. Um, we've talked 
predominantly, of course, about modern slavery, um, but we need to consider how we transition to a low carbon economy and human rights must be part of that. The transition to a low carbon economy must be integrated with human rights as, as part of that. Um, also, greater, in, greater interconnectedness at supranational or regional level around legislation. It is a little bit silly that right now um, we prepare a modern slavery report that tries to meet the, the needs of the UK legislation, tries to meet the um, needs of Australian legislation. Potentially we have to give it another twist. Oh, the lights went out. Potentially we have to give it another twist and add New Zealand in there. Um, and you start to wonder how many different signatures do I have to put on this? We need better certainty and better harmonisation um, that will also stop companies from, um, um, it will stop a situation where you can get unfair competition between countries that have different standards. Of course, sanctions and including the broader range of um, business actors. So that's where we would really see things going. No, thanks, Margaret. Some, some really sort of key words there, transition, compliance, harmonisation, sanctions, but also the key one, I think, is interconnectedness and combining all of these human rights aspects with environmental ones. You mentioned net zero with human rights. I think that is one of the key takeaways into the future as well. Obviously, very much now in, in, in this session focused on the Modern Slavery Act. Um, Amy and Justin, who wants to go first, uh, wrapping up from your side? I'm happy to I'm happy to jump in. So yeah, so from from my perspective, looking to the future and human rights impacts of of companies, um, I think you know we really um, will be seeing a sort of greater understanding and a recognition um, amongst companies that you know for the for the long term health of an entity and for its sustainability. Um, Human rights are absolutely, you know, central to everything. Um, I would like to see a, you know, much more cohesive development over time between business strategies and an alignment of those strategies with the interests of stakeholders of the company. So looking beyond the shareholders to much broader stakeholder groups that would include um, you know, communities uh, in in areas that companies operate within, and also um, you know workers in the supply chains of those companies. So an alignment between the strategy, the business strategy of the company, with those really key stake broad stakeholder um, interests to build the sustainability of an organisation going forwards. Um, and just a recognition that you know human rights are not an add-on; they're not a, they're, you know not something that you can just tack on, but really need to be. And we heard this word a lot from Margaret embedded into um, you know how a business actually um, goes about doing its business. Um, so that really thorough um, integration that that recognises the um, you know the the marriage between strategy and alignment with uh, the stakeholders. Uh, interests of, a, of an entity. Thanks, Amy. Agree with 100% with everything you said, especially around the alignment of um, maybe redefinition of what it actually means to operate. Uh, shareholder value is always the one that's, uh, me being an ex-banker, that was always the sort of the be-all and end-all. But I think we really have to shift away from that uh, very simplistic focus on shareholder value and look at the interconnectedness of everything that an organization does. It probably falls under social license for want of a better term. Um, on that note, Justine, over to you. Thanks. Uh, I guess two issues that I would highlight stemming from what Amy and Margaret have said. And the first one I think is around transparency, is that it's very hard to fix a problem if you can't see it or you don't know where it is. So we have to encourage and work towards a greater degree of transparency um, in this issue. And, and to get there, that means, again, as I said, companies need to work with others to access that information. So to be comfortable stepping outside, you know, their, their comfort zone um, with that. 
because if we don't know what the problem is and modern slavery is often something that's hidden in supply chains people don't step up and say oh I'm a modern day slave. It's something you have to uncover and work with groups on the ground. You have to build that transparency through trust, trust with suppliers, trust with civil society, trust with unions. That's how we're going to start to identify the problem and then start to address it and involve all those groups in, in how you, you fix the problem. I um, mean, the second point is building off what Margaret talked about around a just transition is that modern slavery is not isolated from issues around climate and transition. Um, climate change is going to be, or I think is, the biggest issue that human rights is facing in our generation because it affects so many other issues. It affects work, it affects health, it affects life. Um, and so we need to think about how we move and address that within companies. So the idea is, you know, of us, you know, moving to economies which depend on lithium and cobalt um, in order to make a greener economy then we shouldn't be going back to the 17, 1800s way of working and using people in forms of slavery to gather cobalt um, in the DRC or to exploit lithium without the permission of indigenous populations in South America. So now that we know, you know how to work better, um, we have to apply it to these resources that are come, that we're going to need uh, much more in our, in our supply chain. So for me, it's thinking about, it's thinking about how you embed transparency in that and then thinking about your business operations and, and everything you do, how we move to a transition that will help us better address issues like climate, because that will also affect numbers of people in forced labour and the way that the way that people work. Thanks. Thank you, Justine. And on that note, just a quick summary. Uh, we will be sending out all the other questions that we couldn't get to today, responses to them. We'll be sending the questions to the panel and get their responses. We'll also send a whole bunch of links, uh, the Nesta links that Margaret referred to, the link to the Paper Promises and Broken Promises report as well and the presentations. Uh, thanks everyone for your time today. It was greatly appreciated and look forward to uh, next session at uh, in the very near future, I'd imagine. Thanks everyone, enjoy the rest of your day and take care.